Welcome back to Rewind of the Living Dead. I am Damon Martin. And I'm Patrick Guerra. And Patrick, this week we are finally returning to our Alien franchise review. We've taken a break because we had a lot of new movies to review. And we are getting back into it now with the prequel, as I mentioned in the intro, which, by the way, sorry about the really long intro. I started reading it. It's like, damn, <laughs> I've written a few less words about this movie. Uh, Prometheus, released in 2012. Yes, Damon, released in June of 2012 with a budget of $130 million and a worldwide box office gross of $400 million, starring Numi Rupace. As Shaw, Michael Fassbender as David, Charlize Theron as Vickers, Idris Elba as Janik, Guy Pierce as Peter Wayland. Uh, geez, uh, geez the, the, the list goes on and on. Benedict Juan, Kate Dickey, Vladimir Ferdo Ferdick, Damon, the Night's King, so many more. Uh, of course, written by, as you mentioned, John Spates and Damon Lindelof, based off characters and elements by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusset, and of course, Damon directed by the master himself ridley scott we are back with the alien franchise and now we are in uncharted territory damon now we we are far removed from ripley we are far removed from the xenomorphs or are we we are now at prometheus this grand prequel from the originator himself ridley scott damon i know you were excited about tonight <laughs> oh, I was something about tonight. Let me tell you that much. Uh, yeah. So when we talk about when we talk about the Alien films, when we when we reviewed Alien, Aliens, and even Alien Three, I was like, man, this is really the highlight. And then after I think Alien Three, I said, boy, we're gonna get into some sludge and now going forward because Alien Resurrection was a rough go. And I think I've been very clear on this podcast that I didn't particularly love the next two films we're going to be reviewing, Prometheus and Alien Covenant. Now, is it Revenant or Covenant? Covenant, right? Covenant, yeah. Um, now, I will be honest and say that, and I mentioned this to you off air before we started recording, I saw Prometheus in theaters in 2012, and then I remember watching it again once it came out on like home video, quote-unquote home video, when it was released on DVD, Blu-ray, whatever it was in 2012, 2013, whenever that came out. Now, my history with the film goes like probably yours does, which is I was a massive Alien fan. Now, by 2012, I was fully back into being a, being a cinephile, being a horror fan, way into it. And when I heard they were doing this, this movie had everything I could possibly want in an Alien film. Ridley Scott was coming back, original director. Damon Lindelof, who has created arguably three of the greatest TV series of all time, in my opinion, with lost which i adore i was obsessed with that tv show when it Same. was on uh also the leftovers which was an incredibly brilliant series. so good and then the watchman which was another of i would say maybe one. i mean i, I don't want to put numbers on it but i mean i don't think you'd be wrong in saying maybe one of the top 20 shows of all time like single season shows it blew me away and i love the Watchmen. that was such a unique and original take and david lindelof deserves all the praise for his work on those things so I'm a big Damon Lindelof fan, to be clear, not just because he has an awesome first name, but because he's a great writer. So it had Ridley Scott, it had Damon Lindelof as a writer, and it had an incredible cast. So I was all in when this movie came out. Now, to be fair, sometimes when you have those kind of expectations, you're setting yourself up for failure. I'll be the first to admit that when you get so hyped up. It happened one other movie. I remember this is such a weird correlation I'm making. Do you remember when the Daredevil film came out back in the day with Ben? Oh, yeah. Okay. That was long before the Marvel, you know, yes. uh, you know, the Marvel we now know and love or mostly love. But I love Daredevil. Daredevil and Spider-Man were my two favorite comic book characters growing up. I like the street, what I call street level heroes. I love Spider- Spider-Man was my favorite. Daredevil was my second favorite. And I had plenty of Spider-Man with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. I got my fill with that. Spider-Man never totally went out of the zeitgeist of pop culture but daredevil was kind of like almost like a b-level character he never really he never really got that attention so when i heard they were doing a daredevil movie and i heard kevin smith had been involved with it and i love kevin smith i like ben affleck i don't care who who knows it whatever i was all yeah. for michael hart duncan being cast as kingpin i was so excited and i really like colin farrell i was like man this is gonna be fun Saw it, walked out of the theater and said, well, that didn't work out too well, too well for me. So you can be set up for failure in these situations. And I feel like Prometheus, in a way, I was kind of setting myself up for failure. 
Yeah, you know, expectations, right? I mean, that that we've talked about that before, where they can truly, um, I think, paint the picture for you and and let you down super hard once you get in there. Now, personally, for me, Damon, you happen to know this, and maybe the hardcore fans of this podcast know this, Alien, the original Ridley Scott film from 1979, is my favorite film of all time, of all films, period. I just, anyone asks me, what's your favorite film? Alien, for sure. Every time I watch it, I just bask in its glory and the perfection of that movie. It doesn't take a step wrong. It's a very, very amazing movie, and I love it to death, and I always will. So when I hear that Ridley Scott is coming back to the alien universe, Damon, you know my expectations are absolutely through the roof, and we can't breeze over the man's career. He's had an incredible career, a humongous career. He's an Oscar winner. He makes epics, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But the fact of the matter is, is that he hadn't, in about 30 years, he had not touched sci-fi. He, the last thing he had done, I think, was Blade Runner after that. And then for, for a very long time, he ended up doing kind of sword and sandal, obviously with Gladiator and, and all these just kind of big movies, big movies with big stars. He just he made big Hollywood movies. So to hear that he wanted to come back was exciting right away. And 2012 was a different time for me because I was still very much consuming trailers. Um, so and I was very much like consuming any possible information I could get on movies. And you better believe this was at the top of the list of consumption for me prior to seeing the movie. I read every possible article. I watched every possible interview. I it, Whatever I could find on this movie Prometheus, I dug into. And what excited me most was what excited Ridley most. Ridley said, I really wanted to get back into sci-fi because I hadn't, this is typical Ridley Scott, I hadn't seen a good sci-fi in since the last time I made one, which is a very Ridley Scott thing to say. And he was just like, yeah, I think it's time, I think it was time to, to get back into that universe, and I really wanted to explore the space jockeys. One of the greatest, you know, like, you know, hanging threads in the movie Alien is when that group of, of, uh, of space truckers goes into that ship and they see there that giant figure sitting on that chair mummified to the chair big hole burst in their chest and you go what the hell is that and they never explain it it's a wonderful way to just go big world small window right i'm just we're just kind of walking by this little window and we see something we go what the fuck is that oh don't worry about it we're not even going to talk about it but it's 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 it alludes to a much bigger world now he wanted to play in that world I was totally excited. I couldn't wait. I could because I want to know about the space jockeys. I've wanted to know ever since I saw them. Then the trailers hit. And some of those, you didn't, the one you played was, I think it was a very different trailer than the ones I consumed. They were, it was highlights of the movie. It would show little clips, little bits, little here and there's. I remember very specifically, they were using sounds from the original Alien. And they were using shots that I was comparing to shots from the original Alien. I was like, wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parallels here. Now, I was very excited, Damon. But I was, I, my, one thing about my expectations were I was not going to walk in and see Alien 2. I knew that. I said, I'm not even, I'm not even trying to put that kind of pressure on this movie. I just go, what else has Ridley got for us? And I went to go see it. And I got to be honest, I really liked it then. And I watched it a couple more times. I might have seen it twice in the theater. And I definitely saw it a couple more times at home. And then I kind of let it be. Then Alien Covenant came out. We're eventually going to get to that. I won't waste any breath there today. But I kind of left it where it was. I was like, you know what? Cool. Like that happened. We had Prometheus. Cool. But I probably left it in the dust several years ago. And I haven't really come back to revisit it. And I definitely haven't revisited it since we've had this podcast. So it's time now, Damon, with our trained brains to dig deep into Prometheus, which is a very important kind of cornerstone in this franchise because the original creator is back. Did he do something interesting here, Damon, or did he absolutely shit the bed? I would argue after rewatching this and 
doing it a decade after seeing it the last time. Because the last time I've seen this movie had to be 2013 at the earliest. It came out in 2012, June. I imagine I probably watched it in like December 2012, so it's probably been longer than that. But I'll say 2013. It's been at least a decade since I've seen this movie. And I sat down to watch this very much with the same mindset I had with Midsommar. If you remember our Midsommar episode for the first 150 episodes of this podcast, Midsommar was my beating post alongside Halloween Ends, which became my new beating post (laughs) of movies that I reference when I talk about things I hate in horror. (laughs) I rewatched Midsommar under a different under a different guise, under a different eye years later, and I was shocked how much I enjoyed the film. It, it just played differently in my head. I was like, why do I not remember enjoying it this much, anywhere near this much when I saw it before? Oh, you hate it. You didn't enjoy it at all. You hated it. I hated it. You rewatched it. I rewatched it, and I was like, you know what? I kind of get it now. And again, I think this is just, you know, I've said that, I know I've told this story in the show before. I don't want to repeat myself, but... I remember, you know, I know, again, I, I know I've said that I'll tell a short version. It was years ago when Big Lebowski came out. Everyone thought it was the most hilarious, great stoner comedy of all time. I watched it the first time. I was like, this is dumb. I don't really get the comedy. This is not a good movie. Watched it again. Just happened. And then watched it again. Now I can quote the Big Lebowski verbatim. It's one of my favorite comedies of all time. So I can admit that, like, you can see something once. I, I mean, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is now my favorite Quentin Tarantino film. You know Quentin Tarantino is my favorite director. I saw it in the theater. Me and my girlfriend, who I've gotten her into loving Tarantino films as well. We saw it in the theater the day it came out. We both left. We're like, that was all right. Like, it was good, but man, just not quite what we expected. Then I saw it again and again. And now I've seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood like 30 times, and it has become my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. Repeat viewings are sometimes necessary to truly appreciate a film. And sometimes distance helps. Sometimes time helps. Lots of different things can make you change your perspective. That's why even in our podcast, like it's hard for me to even feel like I'm giving my best opinion after only seeing a movie one time. Like we just repeat yeah, it again. Yeah. I'm like, I've only seen it once. I feel like I want to see it two or three times to really fully soak it in and understand it. That being said, I came into this movie with a complete open mind because I really didn't remember much about it. I I remembered the beats. I remember they were going to find. So the plot of this movie is this. We open the story in some part of ancient Earth where there's a giant white creature that we'll come to know as the engineers. And he drinks some sort of weird liquid. He crumbles into nothing, falls into the ocean. And we assume those are the building blocks of evolution of what eventually becomes humanity. All these years later, a couple of scientists are in Scotland and they dig into a cave and they find a cave painting that features these giant creatures and humankind of that time. And they're pointing up to a group of stars. And it turns out they found these cave paintings all across the world where there was no possible correlation between these people like people in scotland would not have had contact with people in africa when these paintings were made and these scientists are convinced through the star patterns of what they're seeing on these walls that these these creatures are the creators the engineers of humanity and they're pointing to the stars of where they came from and so these scientists have become almost obsessed with let's find the origins of our world let's find the origins of humanity we're going to follow this star map and we're going to go to where they came from to figure out where we came from. That's their mission. So they board a ship, giant stage spaceship called the Prometheus on a two year journey to get to what we eventually will know to become as LV 426, the planet where the xenomorphs are birthed in alien. They arrive on the planet and they find plenty of evidence of where they came from, but they also find a whole lot else. That's the plot of the movie. I'm getting that pretty accurate, right? Oh, yeah. So sitting down the second time, or I guess technically third time, to watch this movie, but again, decade later, I went in very limited memory. I remembered Michael Fassbender's character. I remember Charlize Theron was in it. I completely forgot Idris Elba was in this movie. Like, I was like, oh, Idris Elba, he's the pilot. Completely forgot. But I remembered the beats. Didn't remember everything, remembered the beats. And I remembered the final scene of the almost xenomorph-like creature coming out of the engineer, which you know kind of gives us our shot, our famous shot of the space jockey. So I remember, again, b- bits and pieces. 
But I sat down, I promise you, Patrick, I sat down with a completely open mind saying, you know what? Who knows? It's been a decade. I feel like I'm a much more analytical guy. I have a much more critical eye for film. Maybe I'll have a different perspective. Film was over. And I sat there for about three minutes and I said, I'm never going to get that two hours of my life back. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's one way to put it. So nothing about the new viewing of it. Were you like, oh, I can appreciate this or I can I can appreciate that. It actually made me angrier, to be honest. (laughs) Um, Here's the reason why. And, and, and we get into more detail. And let, let me, listen, I don't ever like to bash a film to the point where there's nothing positive to say. I will give some positive things to say about this movie in a little bit. But here's what really made me angry about this film. This felt like the most unnecessary prequel to ever be a prequel. I don't mind that you make a prequel to Alien. Again, when this was coming out in 2012, I was damn excited. I would say this was probably near the top of my list of my most anticipated films of years because I, I, it's been well documented. Alien and Aliens are two of my all-time favorite films. Aliens, for me, is like top five film ever, and Alien is closely right behind it. Like I adore. I've said it on the show. I think that might be the greatest one-two punch in sci-fi history. Sorry, Star Wars. Yeah, I, I agree. Stand by that, I love those films. So I was, I was jazzed. I was super excited. But when this film was over, and just like when I watched it the other night, I said, "This just felt like the most unnecessary prequel ever." And and here's my biggest problem: if they would have just made this movie as a humanity origin story, I would have still had some problems with it because. Some of the weird, I mean, the decision making in this movie. We'll get into oh, that. Oh yeah, later. we'll get into that. And, yeah. and some of the creatures. There's a lot. There's a lot of weird stuff that happens that I just don't jive with in this movie. But if you just make this a story about like the origin of species, if you title this movie "Origin of Species" and this is just our hunt for where we came from, which is an age old question that people have been asking for centuries. I'm not saying the movie would have been better. But I think I would have less animosity towards it because they were always careening towards trying to tie it to Alien. And my problem is Damon Lindelof, who I adore. I want to read you a quote from Damon Lindelof because the original the original um, script, as I mentioned, by John Spates, which for people who don't know John Spates, he also wrote the Doctor Strange movie. He wrote the Passengers movie, which you probably remember with Chris Pratt and um, why am I free? Jennifer... Um, what am I forgetting her name? Um, Connolly? Jennifer, no, uh, the actress from uh, from uh, Silver Linings Playbook won an Oscar. Jennifer. Um, I oh, I, yeah, I can't get her name going right now. Oh, my God. Why am I, this is bug me. Why am I, you're both having a brain fart. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because Passengers is a very forgettable movie. That's why. It is. Jennifer Lawrence. Thank you. Lawrence, yeah. Uh, Jennifer yeah. Lawrence. God, I don't know why I couldn't pull that out. Uh, but he also recently wrote both Dune Part 1 and Part 2. To give you a little bit of like... No shit. I, didn't, I had he, no idea he wrote those movies. Yeah. John, John Spades wrote both those. So, again, credit where credit's due. He knows sci-fi. But when Damon Lindelof got the script, and I want to read a direct quote from Damon Lindelof that he gave to The Hollywood Reporter in like 2015 when he talked about this film. He said, quote, unquote, I felt John had done a number of really smart things, but I tried to figure out why is it that they are sending the script to me? What is it that they think I can do? The language of Alien Zero, which was the original title of this movie, by the way, Alien Zero was the original title of the movie, was very much an alien reboot, in my opinion. There were face huggers and xenomorphs and eggs. And in the language of that movie by page 30, I had heard Prometheus was a prequel. And there's a problem with prequels. There's something I don't like about prequels, which is there's an inevitability that you're just connecting the dots. So his rewrite became a prequel that's not a prequel. It very loosely ties to Alien. And I'm talking like the loosest ties. I mean, the world, the the space jockeys, and then, of course, the big conclusion when we first see the uh, a version of a Xenomorph emerge from from the from the uh, engineer i read that quote and i said to myself damon not me that <laughs> name, damon lindelof i love you you've made incredible tv shows you've written good movies i i am a damon lindelof fan i really am but nobody's infallible 
And when I read that quote, it just made me angry because I've never read John Spate's original script for Alien Zero, so I don't know exactly how much it ties into, but that sounds like what a prequel would be. Yeah. This... As a standalone film that has no ties to aliens, I'm not saying it'd be great. It might still be a you know a, a two out of five. I don't I don't put we don't put numbers on our ratings, but it it may not be my favorite thing. But there would be some redeeming qualities. But the fact that they kept trying to sort of tie it to Alien over and over and over again, and then you, of course the big conclusion at the end, I was just like, this is this is terrible. This is not a good prequel, and it's not a good story. Yeah, that quote really upsets me, Damon, <laughs> because, you know, now knowing that John Spates and I actually like the original Doctor Strange, the, the, the first one, I wasn't big on the second one. I know you liked it. I didn't. Um, but that first one I really liked. and I liked the story and I love the story in Dune part one and two. They're very lean. They're very um, somber in tone. Um, so I go. And then, and then you just rifle off what Damon Lindelof saw in, in Spate's script and said, oh, yeah, this just kind of felt like more alien. Yeah, we like that, Damon Lindelof. We're <laughs> into that. Like, we like alien. That's kind of why we're showing up. So it sounds to me like he he trimmed away as much as he could to just get us basically to where alien started back in 79. So, yeah, that's a kind of a big fuck up. In my opinion, and listen, believe me, uh, I'm not comparing myself or saying I could do a better job. I'm just saying sometimes you make a call, you make the wrong call. And then the executives get in and everybody goes, well, it's Damon Lindelof. He's a smart guy and da 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 da. And Ridley likes the script. So let's just do it. Let's just do, let's just go with that instead. Because maybe they, at the time, this is 2012. At the time, they were looking at Spates' script, and maybe it was sort of lean and minimalist, like the original movie that happens to be my favorite movie of all time, which is a lean and minimalist movie. Spates seemed to understand that. <laughs> this, and it's funny, like part of my notes was, I was like, this is sort of a maximalist alien movie. It's like more than you ever need in a movie. It, like it's over-engineered, if you will. And I'll tell you, I don't know if I said it, but for the most part, when I watched it in the theater and when I watched it at home uh, many years ago, I pretty much liked Prometheus. And I just went, yeah, that's I like that one. Out of the two prequels, Prometheus is the one I like. Then I watch it for the show, and I'm going, boy, this thing feels empty. <laughs> boy, this shit feels kind of vapid. It just feels like a big vanity project. You know, like, listen... A hundred and how much? A hundred and twenty million? I want to get the number right. A hundred and thirty million dollar budget. Massive budget, especially in 2012. That those are the big budgets in 2012. The, you you're crossing the hundred and twenty million dollar mark. You're talking about a huge movie. And let's put let's be honest. Ridley Scott knows how to fucking use every penny, and he made a big giant world. And he made a he made he was. I, I found an interview with him. That was just six minutes of him talking about how he thought about the spacesuits and how to design them. The man's a, the man's a, like a mad genius with stuff like that. But maybe we shouldn't have gave him all that money because he just went, yeah, let's just do all those things. And it the experience ended up being kind of empty. It's a big, it's a big old sci-fi movie that's not really asking big questions. One of the big things that that stood out to me this time around, and it's a great cast. I read off all those names. Those are fantastic actors, all of them. There was almost no character work. It was almost all plot. Anytime you gathered these uh, these astronauts and scientists in a room, it was just to explain something. There was a small story with Shaw. You know, Shaw Shaw and her 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 guy, uh, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a scientist team, but they're also lovers. You know, they can't have kids. It's not really a big part of the movie. It's not. It only comes up after all the big discoveries and shit. And it's kind of dropped in there and then it's plucked out, you know, like, it's just, okay, we dropped that in just to give them a little, this was just, it was so empty. I didn't know who anybody was. I didn't know why they were there, didn't know why they cared. You could throw that back in my face and say, well, did you know that about Alien? 
No, I didn't know. I didn't know shit about any of the people in Alien, but I knew they had lived lives. I knew they were. I knew that they had lots of history with each other. There was tons and tons of camaraderie and familiarity, and their reactions and their acting was very real. The acting in Prometheus is very performative. It's very 2012. It's, it reminds me of that era. Just, of, just felt huge. It, and it was like I was like I don't nothing's nothing's landing here. And so now, after all these years of going, yeah, I kind of like Prometheus. I kind of don't like Prometheus. <laughs> I'm looking at it and going, I don't really like this movie. It's not really that good. It looks great. And I'm, I'll tell you right now, some of my positives. When I saw this on the big screen, it was impressive. Ridley Scott makes big movies. You probably shouldn't bother seeing a Ridley Scott movie at home. See it on a big screen because he knows how to put it in front of a hundred foot screen and make it really big. And it felt big. It felt huge. I think most of the CG actually holds up pretty damn well and whatever practical effects they did. So those are some positives. A lot of high production value. And as I said, there's a fantastic, great cast. They really are good. And one thing he did promise on delivering was the origin of the engineers. Does he get into it enough? Not really, but also at the same time, like maybe good thing you didn't. They were going, they were just doing too much and too much and nothing all at the same time. It's very strange, but they did give us engineers, Damon. They did, they did dip into that world. And I got to know a little bit more about those engineers. So what we ultimately got, cause you go, well, why even make this? Like, why, why, why is this part of the alien franchise? I walked out of it going, or, you know, after this last viewing, and I thought to myself, this was just totally a side quest in the alien universe. And the Xenomorph feels very tacked on to the end. Like, it just feels like, drip, it's just tacked on. It's not even tied to the ship or anything like that. You know, with the space jockey sitting in the chair and the bursting, that, that didn't even happen in this movie. It's just, it, it was almost like an afterthought. Like, oh shit, we should probably put something in that has a Xenomorph in it. It's pretty much just a side quest that has almost nothing to do with anything that goes on in any of the other alien movies. That's fine, but you got to make it good. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, like oh, it's fine to have a side quest, but can it be good? We're going to get a shot at that in August with alien Romulus and Fetty Alvarez and see what we get on our side quest. We're about to get a side quest with a whole lot of fucking face huggers and blood. Sign me up. I want to see what it's all about. Prometheus, yeah, this ends up having a pretty, I would say, empty story. We're going to get into this in a moment, Damon. We're going to have to talk about the comically bad decisions that these characters make. I, I have, I have some like thoughts on that too, but I want you to, I want you to touch on that, Damon, because these might be the dumbest characters in the entire Alien franchise, uh, like ever. Let me let me backtrack slightly to what you said before about where the problems start, especially in the characters, because what you mentioned about Alien is absolutely true. We don't really know anything much about the characters in Alien, but as you mentioned so brilliantly, is from minute one, meeting Ripley and everybody else on that ship, you can tell they've been together, they know each other, they're intimate. We always talked about how horny, how horny that movie was really in, in behind. Low-key horny movie. Um, but we got a sense that these characters knew each other and we knew what drove them. And to me, knowing what motivates a character is a huge part of storytelling. Whatever your story is, you need to know why this character is motivated to do what they're doing. This cast felt so vapid in like what they were doing. They didn't know each other. They were all kind of just thrown together and put on a ship together. And apparently basically just freeze dried for two years thrown in there and they didn't even really meet each other until after they're out of the freeze dry which another is another strange choice which seems really on bizarre the writing yeah. side yeah yeah like on the writing side like oh yeah we never even really know these people and then we're just gonna throw them in this ship you know put them in their containers freeze them for two years and then bring them out and they're gonna meet each other that seems really odd and they'll learn their mission <laughs> two years later like yeah, what just, that's weird uh, a lot of stuff. So the characters felt very vapid, very empty, very, again, I didn't, outside of the two main characters, Shaw and her, and her boyfriend, I, I didn't, I don't know what drove anybody in this film. None at all. And even the, the quote unquote twist 
when you find out that Waylon's on the ship and Charlize Theron's character is apparently his daughter because she calls him father, that to me was like the most unnecessary twist ever. Like, A, yeah. I didn't need him there, but B, I really didn't need her to be like, father. I'm like, you're yeah, not getting your Star Wars moment. I didn't like that then either, by the way, back yeah. way back in 2012. <laughs> Also, one big problem I had, and this this was like, again, this has nothing to do with story, but like this bugs me and this drives me absolutely insane when people decide to do prequels to movies with technology in them. The technology in Prometheus is so far advanced beyond anything we saw in Alien. And I saw I, I looked up a timeline because they've never truly defined the time. I mean, we know that. Aliens takes place 57 years after Alien because they say that when they rescue yeah. Ripley and they say it's been 57 years. We get that part of it. But I looked it up and I think I saw online, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe you can correct me, but I saw this is supposed to take place like 29 or 30 years before Alien. It was Something Ripley, like that, yeah. yeah. okay. The tech, I mean, this is like... This is like having iPods and then like a 60s like record player. Like the aliens like the record player, but somehow Prometheus 30 years earlier, they're the little iPods and iPhones and holograms. And I'm like, listen, I understand you can't just redo everything you had in Alien, but the technology is so far beyond anything in Alien in this movie. That right, it, that set me on a bad precedent from moment one seeing this film. When they introduced the big hologram of Wayland, and I'm like, isn't this supposed to be like 30 years before Alien? Where the fuck was this? Like, I understand <laughs> you're dealing with like a cargo, a, a ship that's a, a scrapyard, basically. They're, they're collecting scrap across the universe. I understand they're not going to have the highest end tech and everything, but come on. Like, you got to... That's that bugged me right out of the gate. I'm like, how's the technology this much more further advanced 30 years earlier? That to me was ridiculous, and that was one of the first big mistakes they made in this movie. And then from there, just there's just there was I had no connection with these characters. I didn't love any of them, I didn't hate them, I just didn't care. And we've yeah. talked about that a million times in horror films, Patrick. If you don't care about the characters, you don't care where they live or die. You got a problem. Even if you hate them and you want them to die, at least you have an opinion on them. These characters, I couldn't have cared less about any of them. The one interesting character, and here goes my prose of this movie, and boy, I tell you what, from uh, from uh, O'Bannon and and uh, and uh, why am I reading? Shusette. And Shusette, from Ronald Shusette, from them to James Cameron, and then, of course, now to John Spates. I'm giving John Spates credit because Damon Lindelof said the one part of his script he really liked was the David character, played by Michael Fassbender. That's the one he kind of left alone. That's the only redeeming quality of this movie yeah. for me. David is the one interesting character in this movie, and he's the freaking android. There's something about writing androids that they always get right. Ash was a great character. Bishop was an incredible character, and David in this film is like the best character. That's the one character, and he's the one that has no emotion, no, no, like actual, like that's the one character. I was like, I'm kind of interested in David. Like he's kind of an interesting character. I was in, I was in, I was in for that. I was down for that. But outside of that, I had no connection to these characters. And then again, you're right. It's a visually striking film. Really, Scott knows how to shoot sci-fi. He absolutely does. One thing I had to remind myself re-watching this, and I'm guilty of this in the past with other movies as well, not just Alien. We have to remember sometimes that the director has the visual sense of a movie and has the, um, the look and the feel of whatever movie they're directing. But that doesn't mean they came up with the story. Sometimes it does. Yeah, James Cameron does that a lot. Of course, Quentin Tarantino does that a lot. There are directors like that. But I had to remind myself, the excitement I felt over Ridley Scott returning to Alien, I should have tampered that down right back then because he didn't write the original story. He didn't write this one. He directed it. He knows the visual sense of it, but he didn't have anything to do with the story. He maybe helped mold it a little bit, but he did not come up with any of that. I had to remind myself of that because we were like, oh, Ridley Scott's coming back. Yes, we maybe would have been more excited if O'Bannon and Shusette were coming back and writing this film and saying, man, they're coming back to their pro their their original project. And then we get into once they land on the planet. 
the amount of dumb <laughs> decisions. I saw an interview actually as I was doing research on this film. Maybe you saw this. You probably it probably popped up when you did like Prometheus interview or something. Did you see the Quentin Tarantino clip from like? I did. Yeah, where he talked about this and he's like, I like Prometheus, but the scene with the space cobra was so <laughs> stupid. And I put that in the intro, by the way, when I said we're going to tackle a space cobra. Uh, he's like, the decision to just like taunting a space cobra has to be one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in a movie. And I, after I watched the film and I saw the Quentin clip, I was like, oh my God, he's right. That was one of the dumbest moments in cinema history. The decision making in this movie is unbelievably asinine. And as a fan of science in general, I understand wanting to explore. I understand wanting to ask the impossible questions and know the impossible answers. I get all that. But some of the things they do in this movie, Patrick, are just mind-numbingly stupid. I'm so glad that we segue into this because it's a, it was a big part of my notes. It might have been the biggest part of my notes, actually, because I really did remember this movie pretty well. And it was pretty much the same movie. I just now I could see it as as empty as it was. And you're right. Ridley Scott, visual dynamo. He storyboards every inch of the thing himself. He visualizes the entire movie. And then he gets the best production designers and everything. And like I said, one of the big pros of this movie is that it is a fantastic big screen experience. Still holds up visually, still looks great. Every frame of painting. That's Ridley Scott. That's what he does. But he works fucking fast. Take all the top directors, take Cameron, take uh, Denis Veneux, you know, take Greta Gerwig and take Ridley Scott and give them 60 days to make a movie. The only one who's going to finish his movie is Ridley Scott. But that comes with a price. He might overlook the character aspects. He might overlook stupid decisions because he's visualizing it. You know, I know he, and, and believe me, I know he knows story. I'm not going to pretend like he doesn't, but he is very much focused on getting the work done and he can get it done quick. He can turn movies over like a motherfucker. He came out and kind of sniped Martin Scorsese recently. He said, I made six movies in the time it took him to make Killers of the Flower Moon. Okay, but how many are we talking about right now, Ridley? <laughs> really? Like, think about it. Like, how many were we like, wow, did you see that Ridley Scott movie and how great it was? He can do them fast and he can make them look great. They're always going to look great. But certain things can suffer. But interestingly enough, and I, I did, I saw the Quentin, and I looked at it because I said, if I saw this, I know Damon clicked on it. I know Damon clicks on a, on a Quentin Tarantino quote. And he was right. And I remember all the way back in 2012, while I was enjoying this movie and the space carver scene comes up, I go, what in the ever loving fuck? That makes it like no sense. But so, so I remember that very vividly going, that's a stupid, stupid, in, in, in a movie that I'm liking, that's a, that's a red flag, uh, uh, you know, big alarm sounding off. Why, why is that the stupidest move I've ever seen in a movie? Watching it this time, I was watching the beats and everything leading up to this. And this must be Damon Lindelof. Damon Lindelof's going, well, Ridley Scott wants a horror movie. So Damon Lindelof must have watched, I don't know, five Friday the 13th movies or something and said, what do horror movies do? And I, I'm going to bear with me because I'm going to try and read this, but I'm going to try and just articulate it, not just straight read it. But like any other traditional horror movie, there is a point in this movie where everyone peels off to bone. That literally happens. It's like Shaw and 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 Holloway, the, the, the scientist couple, they're very amorous because they just found the greatest discovery in the history of mankind. We found intelligent life that indeed probably created us. We found them. So they get all amorous and they go off and they start to bone. Captain Idris Elba and... And Lieutenant Charlize Theron, they look at each other. They're two of the best looking people on the planet. And they go, you know, what? it's probably a good idea that we go fuck right now. <laughs> they go and take off and bone. Meanwhile, back in the, uh, the this yurt that they found out in the middle of nowhere, covered with, you know, alien goop and shit like that, are the two lost dumbass scientists. <laughs> and they start fucking with shit. <laughs> it is right out of a fucking Friday the 13th movie. <laughs> 
I mean, it, literally. And and they go poking around shit that they shouldn't be poking around, and they fuck with an alien cobra. And and let's not and let's not, just and let's not forget these are the two guys who ran for cover because they were scared of what they were seeing. Right, they ran and for cover. Only, so not only do they start fucking with the alien material, they're doing it after the like, I don't want to be here. This is we don't need to be here. We're going back to the ship. So not only do they not make it back to the ship, but then like, oh yeah, let's just start fucking with the exact thing we were scared of ten minutes before. Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. No, no, it's it's true. And it's weird that they even got lost and like no one in that whole time, like no one started boning until until like all like you know, all was lost and they had to hunker down for the night. <laughs> And I'm going, okay, this is all wildly stupid. But it is very much the catalyst of your standard 80s horror movie. So do I hate it? Like, no, I don't actually hate it, Damon. Because I go, I think that's what Damon Lindelof was trying to do. I never saw it then. I promise you, I did not. Back in 2012, I wasn't like, oh, this is just like any other fucking camp counselor slasher. That's exactly what he does in this. These beats are exactly 80s horror beats. So I go, I'm going to give this movie just a little bit of grace here. It was baffling because it was a $130 million sci-fi epic that was also tied into an alien franchise that is relatively smart for the most part. It just, Damon Lindelof came in and go, what if I just do a dumb 80s horror scene? We'll see how that goes. It's certainly the horror catalyst of this movie. So as dumb as it is, Damon, I'm going to give it a few points. It doesn't mean that now all of a sudden I love this movie. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, I think I think I found the thing Damon Lindelof was trying to do. It's stupid. But as we love 80s movies, a lot of them are, are fucking stupid. We used to have categories that just celebrated the stupid choices in dumb 80s horror movies because we love them. And he just happened to inject into a $130 million sci-fi blockbuster. And the results were odd. So you saying that and explaining it the way you just did, I'm kind of on board with you a little bit. But not that I like this movie now. because It I doesn't don't. make me like it, but it's yeah. like I see what's going on here. So your explanation, you're right. You're 150% right. I'm sitting as you're explaining, I'm like, holy shit, you're absolutely right. This is a Friday the 13th movie. <laughs> totally. The Alien Universe. Now, that being said, one of the things I applaud, particularly about Alien and Aliens, from the original to the sequel, is that all of the quote unquote kind of dumb decisions or bad things that happen, you understand them why they happen. You know, the unknown of a face hugger attaching itself to Kane. And then it just falls off and dies. Of course, you don't think anything's wrong. And so you'd invite him back in for dinner. You're all going to go back into deep freeze and go home. You think it's just a horrible incident and that's it. No, there's no contamination, no proof of contamination. You're just gone. And so when the thing comes out and goes flying, you're just stunned. I, we get all that. And every decision that's made after that, trying to hunt down the alien and even the dumb things that happen. Like, I know we talked even about like when they added in the extra scene, some of the stuff that was added in was extraneous and unnecessary and actually over explained and kind of made it seem dumb. But even then I was like, even then back then, remember our alien episodes, I actually kind of understand the, the, the motivation of what they were trying to do in aliens. I'm not going to talk about the entire plot, but one of the biggest plot points is when they first discover the aliens down in the sub basement level three, they realize that they're standing on top of the coolant, uh, the coolant generators, which means if they fire their thermonuclear weapons, there's going to be a thermonuclear explosion and adios muchachos, goodbye Marines. And so there's a reason why Lieutenant Gorman says, you know, you know, put away all your weapons. You know, we you can't we can't have any firing down there. We need you to be down. You know, we need you to uh, we, you know we need you to to put everything away, and we need you to just use hand weapons and no cannons, no fire. You know, nothing like that. She's fucking crazy. Hey, what the hell are we supposed to use, man? Harsh language. Exactly. Exactly. R.I.P. Frost. Right. Yes, Frost. You had it right. What the hell are we supposed to use, man? Harsh language. <laughs> But the fact that they explained it that way makes it more believable of why they had to put away their big 
science, they're big marine muscle weapons because they're standing. That's and we talked about the intelligence of the aliens, like why they put their colony there is because they knew it was the most, it was the safest place they could go where nobody could really attack them. We talked about the intelligence, the evolving intelligence of the xenomorph. Then you get to Prometheus, <laughs> <laughs> where it's like the opposite. Everything is the wrong decision. And as you said, the two main couples go to bone and there's an emergency call from the people stuck in there. They just like, there's a storm coming and they're just like, ah, you'll be fine. We'll pick you up in the morning. Don't worry about the alien colony that we just discovered and all the weird shit in there. You'll be good. Yeah. And then, as I said, the two scientists, one's a geologist, one's a biologist. They're just like, hold on. We're scared to death. We do not want to be here. We're getting the fuck out of here. Hold on now. There's this weird black liquid dripping from these weird vases. What the fuck could this be? Let's touch it. Let's get around the liquid. Oh, there's a space cobra. Let me put my face right in the fuck in front of it and see what is going on. It is the, I mean, it is mind-numbingly stupid. But as you described it as like a bad 80s slasher, you're absolutely correct. So, I'm with you. I understand it now. Or I, at least I hope that's what he was going for. If not, <laughs> if not, we really need to have a deeper discussion with David Lindelof. But if that's what he's going for, I kind of understand. It's still terrible. It's the worst decision and the reason it's so bad is because all the other alien films are so smart yeah and you're like how could you get this so wrong <laughs> and you're dealing with scientists these are supposed to be the most brilliant minds in the world this is the decisions they make but as you described it you know what you're right like i have to give you points because you're absolutely right this is the fucking plot of a friday the 13th movie holy shit i never got that until just this moment in space, you got to go to Pound Town. <laughs> I, I mean, come on. That's I mean, that's ultimately what he did. Now, I mean, all joking aside, we talked about this with Alien Resurrection, which I feel I still think is the bottom of the barrel for the Alien movies, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it, it was clear that uh, Joss Whedon, the writer of that movie, just didn't give a fuck about Alien movies. Like he was like, I'm just gonna write this, and you're like, okay, cool, but it's it's got Ripley in it. Maybe try to get it a little close, and he's like, nah, nah, we won't. We're just gonna way the fuck out here. Damon Lindelof went, I'll just do an '80s slasher. That's how we'll make the horror happen. <laughs> I was like, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, well, I can't certainly go around saying Friday the 13th, but one of my favorite slasher franchises and deduct points for me from prometheus because they're doing the same thing they're just doing it with a bigger budget i just think that that doesn't land with broader audiences right or it, it doesn't land in i think a sci-fi setting or maybe it does and maybe i'm totally fucking wrong i'd love to hear from somebody on that and see what people really think about my theory in terms of this but i think that's what it was it was just like here's you need a horror catalyst fine i'll give it to you the way we've given it to you for the last 35 years fucking bone like, like they're gonna go bone and people are gonna get screwed in the process it's you know it's it's return of the living dead it's friday the 13th it's sleepaway camp like here we go can i ask this question um this and this goes back into the plot and 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 loosely very loosely tying this to an alien film which again that's probably the part that drives me the craziest about this movie as far as when it comes to the plot and the story is that this is a prequel. Now, I do know I've read interviews with Ridley Scott where he had said, like, after they made this one, they started planning for Prometheus 2, 3, and 4, and, like, they wanted to go much deeper before they actually tied into Alien, which to me makes absolutely zero sense. That's, yeah. that's like, after the fact saying, oh, you know what? We just really didn't tie to Alien in any way, shape, or form except for the final scene, so let's just go ahead and make more of these and try to get it right. Like, no, it, it didn't work. But... If you're going to make this an alien prequel, and listen, I'm all for evolution. I believe in evolution. I'm a big fan of evolution. Sorry, religious folks. I'm a big, big, big fan of evolution. I am 100% for it. But if you, and you know this as well, you're a smart guy, Patrick. You believe in evolution as well. You're, a, you're I do. much like myself. Evolution takes place over hundreds of thousands of years. That's like the thing that gets missed when people are like, how are we related to the monkey? How are we related to chimpanzees? Because it takes hundreds of millions of years for things to evolve. Do we see things evolve quicker? Sure. But even that takes years and years and years to actually happen. 
why, and I know you don't know the answer to this. I mean, I want you to give me your version of an answer, but I want to ask you the question. Why, in all of their brilliant genius of making this movie, and they're trying to eventually connect it back to Alien, I understand the alien goop, the black goop, the biological weapon that these engineers created morphs and twists and creates all kinds of weird shit space cobras and space octopus and all kinds of weird shit why did they just not have it evolve into what we know it because this is supposed to be 30 years before alien i have a hard time believing the weird fucking octopi that comes pouring out of Numi Rapace's body in that C-section scene, 30 years later is now the face hugger. That may, I mean, you're really asking me to suspend disbelief and like say that between then and now in 30 years, that's what that thing becomes or some version. Why overcomplicate it? I understand you're not trying. Like reading Damon Lindelof's quote that I read earlier. Yes, I'm with you. It drives me insane when I hear that quote because I'm like, yeah. why make this movie? Why why are you making this a movie? And I understand you're trying. You're saying it's too easy. It's just you're just connecting the dots. That's what a fucking prequel is, dude. <laughs> All the weird like space cobras and space octopi and fucking yeah. all this weird shit. And and it's just to get to the xenomorph that's born in, in literally a almost a post credit scene basically in this movie after right. everything's already done. Like, why do you overcomplicate it? Like, I understand maybe you're gonna have a different version of the face hugger. Maybe it's not exactly what we're used to seeing. Okay, but it just I and I understand that the alien the the weird alien biological weapon liquid that supposedly is the cause of all this which again that really bugs me too that that's really what we're boiling this down to is that it's a biological weapon that went wrong again okay i'm just i'm rolling with the punches here at this point but even a biological weapon would develop into something recognizable if that's where we're going if we're saying that these aliens these xenomorphs are only 30 years old by the time we meet them in Alien. That's the They haven't even been around for that long. That's what they've evolved to in 30 years. The eggs, the face huggers, the queen alien, all that shit in 30 years from this? That's what you're telling me. That's the origin of what we see in Alien. Patrick, get the fuck out of here. That's all <laughs> I'm saying. Well, you know you know what's funny is when, when I hear you say that Ridley had plans for Prometheus 2, 3, and 4, I think they were really trying to tell like literally a different story. I mean, there's a reason it's called Prometheus and not alien Prometheus. They were trying to separate it out. They were literally trying to say, this is another story in this universe. Yes. This biological weapon will eventually birth a xenomorph, but that's not the story we're going to talk about here. And then you get spades in, which now I'm dying to read his script. I got to know what he wrote. I'll have to go find that somewhere. Um, and then you get Damon Lindelof who goes, well, I guess we got to tie it over to alien at some point. So he just rushes us over to it. Um, I don't think it was their intention to even breach the topic of the xenomorph in these movies. I don't think it was. And I think that either, either in rewrites or, or tests or studio interference or whatever, somebody just said, guys, we're getting everybody together for fucking alien remake or, or alien prequel. We need alien in here. Get, get it in here somehow. So they get it in here. And I think what happened, I mean, the best way I, the best steps I can take is that we, there's something, there's an element we haven't talked about yet, which is Waylon Yutani is funding this whole thing. We get to see them for the first time ever. Waylon Yutani is. And they, it's just Waylon in this movie, by the way. There's no Yutani. In right. That. Yeah. There isn't Yutani yet, but, but <laughs> Waylon himself is in this movie. And so they're they're paying for this mission, but of course they're the giant evil corporation. They want something out of it, and so they sick David, their their droid, or their artificial human, and and they they go whatever you find there, take a little bit of it and make sure it gets back with us somehow. However, we these scientists they 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 want to discover they want to discover the origins of mankind. Great, is there something there we can sell to military? 
figure that out. Well, David, pretty smart AI, goes, yeah, sure, I think we can. And he infects uh, 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 um, Holloway with it, and Holloway impregnates uh, um, uh, Shaw with it. And that bursts that little octopus thing. And I think what that was, without them like saying anything, which, by the way, that's fine if they didn't want to say it out loud, that was the very first face hugger. That was the very first thing that could do something else. We watched step one in that evolution towards the um, to, towards the xenomorph. And then that face hugger grows into that giant thing. I don't know why it grew giant. I don't that part I don't understand. But it grows giant and then it, it, it attaches itself to the first thing it finds, which is an engineer. These engineers are clearly like superhuman or, or, you know, next level human. They're giant, they're muscular, and they seem to not need, they seem to be superior to us in all ways. That giant face hugger attaches itself to the engineer and it births the first proto xenomorph. And so that's, so that's, that's the best way I can see that. That's how it went down. It was just like this, this, this bioweapon mixed with these things created what is eventually going to become a xenomorph basically by accident. And then covenant, which we will get into is David designing the perfect weapon. And then that'll actually really tie to alien. We'll talk about that in that episode. We'll leave it there. But that's the steps that I saw. And even way back then in 2012, I was like, okay, that's what they're telling us is happening. And like for once, like, you know, I've talked about this many times, how studio interference can really ruin a movie. And like, we talked about this with Abigail, not to go back to our last episode about how you got to believe it was the studio who's like, we got to put the trailer out there. We got to tell these people what this movie is before they go see it. And every single creator that I've seen on TikTok and YouTube and everyone else, everyone's had the same complaint we did, which is you put too much in the trailer. Like how much better would this have been if you had not given us the twist in the trailer? This is one time where I feel like the studio may have actually been right. Like you're telling us this is an alien prequel. You're telling our audience this is an alien prequel. Ridley Scott's coming back. You're teasing, you're putting trailers together with the alien music. You're telling us this is an alien prequel. We've got to tie it to alien. And as I said, if they had just made this movie called the origin of species, and this is just about a group of scientists desperately trying to find out where we came from. And this is where it leads them to this alien planet. And we find out the horror is the engineers didn't, they, they, we were almost a, a, a creation of accident. For these engineers, they didn't mean to make us. And actually, they're engineering a way to wipe us out because we are inferior to them, is the way I took it. And that's what they were yeah. coming back to do to basically wipe us out because we were an inferior species that they created. So they created this liquid goo that they were going to travel back to Earth with and unleash, which is when they resurrect the one the one engineer is still alive he is his mission is still very much the same all these years later which is to take the ship go to earth drop the black goo on there and watch earth get evaporated by this deadly biological weapon if that's your movie i'm not saying it would have been better because so much of this movie is still is still terrible regardless of like the alien connection like we said the bad decisions some of the weird, like, I, again, there's a lot, not to repeat, like, there's a lot wrong with this movie, even if it's not an Alien movie. But the fact that you're tying it to Alien, and you're, it's almost like this is an Alien prequel that they don't want to be an Alien prequel. Like, Damon Lindelof's quote pretty much tells us he's writing a movie that's not really an Alien prequel. But then you stick it in there at the end, after everything's already done, that the first version of the Xenomorph pops out, it just feels like such a disconnected mess. Like, it's just everything in this movie feels like it's like they're fighting against this being an alien prequel, yet it's an alien prequel. You know what I mean? That would be like that would be like going to see Star Wars The Phantom Menace, and we, we land on Tatooine, the planet where Luke Skywalker's from, and we meet, you know, sand people, and, and we hear about the Empire, but there's no Anakin Skywalker, there's no Jedis, there's no Stormtroopers, there's no real imp like, there's nothing. We're just on Tatooine hanging out in the fucking desert. Star Wars fans are like, what in the fuck is going on here? And then the very end of the movie, we see a lightsaber click on. 
Holy shit. Could you imagine like the how I rate Star Wars fan? That's what this is. <laughs> this is an I alien mean, prequel that doesn't like that exaggerated. But this is an alien prequel that doesn't want to be an alien prequel. Like they're fighting against it. Like even the octopi creature, they didn't want to just give us the face hugger. So you got to give us a version of the face that, that grows into weird ginormous size to justify it attacking yeah. the the engineer and having this weird extended battle at the end with this. It's just, it, it, I really truly believe this is, this is Damon Lindelof saying, I don't want to write an alien prequel, so I'm not going to, but you're going to force me to jam pack in a couple of things that connect this world, like the ship, like the space jockey. There's a couple of key elements I got to throw in there so you know it's an alien film. But other than that, I'm not giving you your fucking Darth Vader. I'm not giving you your fucking Anakin Skywalker. I'm not like, fuck your lightsabers. I'm not giving you any of that. I'm making my movie. That's what this felt like. <laughs> Yeah, it feels a little bit like a movie made by committee, which is a problem. You know what I mean? Like, it uh, what a movie really needs is vision. It needs a very, very specific vision. And it feels like Damon Lindelof was out on his own, like striking out on his own. It's very weird. Like, we're talking about him way more than we're talking about Ridley Scott. Mm -hmm. Ridley Scott makes the choices on set. But at the, like I said, what, he, what does he do? He sits down with the script. He goes, you fuckers like this shit? Is it good? Are we going to do this? Okay, great. And then he just starts fucking drawing. And then he visualizes the movie and then the movie looks great in, in you know, at, in 2012, I was dazzled by how good the movie looked. And I didn't see the, the problem with the movie was the story. And the problem was Damon Lindelof didn't want to write an alien movie. So he wrote something else and he just tacked alien into it as best he could. And the, and then the, 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 the studio comes in and goes, Hey, we, it's an alien movie. I mean, come on, this is our franchise. This is how we make the money. Like give us alien stuff. And he begrudgingly throws some alien stuff in there. And that's exactly how it feels. So the whole thing, kind of a mess. It, it is. I mean, it look, it's a good looking mess, but it's a mess nonetheless. It is a very good looking movie. And again, visually, and like, I, you're right. Cause I looked at Ridley Scott's uh, filmography as we were sitting here talking. And cause I like Ridley Scott a lot. And he's made a lot of great movies. I'm looking at his yeah. list right now. Alien, of course, is a legendary Blade Runner, of course, legendary I actually really like Legend, that movie he made. I like that. Uh, Black yeah, Rain too. with Michael Douglas, I like that movie. Thelma and Louise, one of the, my favorite movies. I enjoy that movie a lot. Uh, I was never a huge fan of G.I. Jane, but I know a lot of people really enjoyed that movie. Gladiator, I enjoy. I actually just rewatched that maybe a month or two ago and kind of forgot how much I did like that movie. Uh, Hannibal wasn't great. Didn't like Hannibal. Black Hawk Down was super popular. Wasn't my favorite movie, but again, I'm not a huge war movie fan. Uh, American Gangster is one of my all-time favorite movies. I fucking love that movie. It's one of my favorite Denzel Washington performances. So I love that movie. Uh, he made Exodus, Gods and Kings, which is one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> but then a year later, he made The Martian, which is one of my probably top good movie. movies ever made. I love The Martian. That's, I, I, I was obsessed with The Martian for a lot of time. All the Money in the World was okay. Last Duel I thought was underrated. I thought that was actually a pretty good movie. Didn't I get liked The Last Duel uh house of gucci was god awful i liked I was, it i hated that movie it but, reminded me of ridley scott doing martin scorsese is what i saw here's, here, my, i'm sorry to give you like a big long ramble i want to go just through his filmography of what i loved and hated mostly what I, he's done i've liked there's a couple in there i didn't like but i wanted to end up on house of gucci for this reason i hated house of gucci i went in thinking man this is gonna be one of my favorite films of the year and it was trash to me but visually, it's a great movie. It's a stunning movie in that way. It looks like a Martin Scorsese-style movie, which is what Ridley Scott was clearly going for. He was making his own Martin Scorsese movie, except it's just it's just pales <laughs> comparison to even the worst Martin Scorsese movie. But I love Lady Gaga. I I, I love. I mean, let's not get into Jared Leto's performance in that movie. But, like, it's just, it's a very disjointed, like, not great story, and it's just, I don't know. It was just very, when it was over, I was like, this was just not a real, like, it was a, what was it, like a three-hour movie? I was like, this could have been two hours. It just, it just didn't do it for me. Visually, though, it was a great movie. You know, the the the, the look of it was great. The You know, for what is this, essentially a drama, not a lot of big, you know, not a lot of big set pieces, but, yeah, it was, it was well done. It was well acted, except for Jared Leto. 
I that I can compliment, and that's all Ridley Scott. But the other parts was what I had a problem with. And so as we talked about, like Prometheus is his movie, but he didn't write it. And the problems with Prometheus start, continue, and finish with Damon Lindelof's script. Because that, it, I mean, yeah, the performances, we'll get into performances here in a little bit. We're going to reopen a, a famous award on this show in a little bit. There are some of that, too, don't get me wrong. Some of the choices that are made in terms of the performances we can have some fun with here. But visually stunning. Now, again, I still have a problem with the technology, because, and I think you'd agree with me. How do you have this technology yeah. 30 years before Alien? But again, l- l- I mean, even that, I'll justify and say, well, you know what? These are the you rich could, yeah. trillionaires. Yeah. They had better technology than what they gave the shit pilers the shit, yeah, the, the shit those shit. are truckers over there and these are and these are elon musk and his crew over here yeah, yeah the shit shovelers are driving the 80 chevelle these guys are driving <laughs> the tesla i get okay so even that i can visually stunning oh, but what and can i throw one visual thing i did have a problem with though and maybe you didn't maybe you didn't even notice this the planet they're on we know is lv426 right like that because that's what I, now is. when i watched it it was like lv422 or something it was but the ship is there that has to be the same ship that has to be the same planet because that's the ship that's an alien that's the ship that's an aliens the alien ship the big yeah, yeah. Ship. yeah yeah okay why does it look like it's wyoming in the middle of the daytime in like july in this movie but then you get to alien and aliens it's like the darkest dystopian looking like cloudy just dark like there's no sunshine plan i understand atmospheres can change but could you at least gotten that part the same like it seems like it's a pretty dank dark planet and this one looks I, like they're on a different world i don't want to fully answer that because i didn't do my research on it. i just i have had very very busy last couple months and so i really haven't been able like normally for the alien franchise i'd be watching like behind the scenes i'd be watching director's yeah. commentary so i can't connect the dots for you and i'm but not you gonna notice att- right like, you didn't to. notice but the it's world a, doesn't look the same in in my in my just this is just based off of how i've always watched this movie i never saw this planet as lv426 I saw it as like an outpost and maybe it's like 426 and 427 is over there somewhere. Like maybe it's just nearby, but then that still fucks up like the story. Like, I don't get it quite. I don't yeah. quite get it. Yeah. And it doesn't make a hundred percent sense to me. So I'm just like, I don't know what they're doing exactly, but I'm not going to try to pretend to explain it. Cause I don't know. But visually all those things work again. It's not that it all comes down to the story and that's where everything falls apart in this movie. Yeah, no, it's the story. The story's the issue for sure. So let's let's get into some categories here. We do have a lot to get to with uh, with categories. We're going to kick things off with best performance because again, even though you can clearly tell I do not like this movie, <laughs> even the worst of movies outside of maybe like Thirty Miles to Nowhere. Go back and check out like episode three of this podcast and talk about one of the movies we just absolutely raked over the coals and one of one of the greatest podcasts we've ever done yes one of the funniest (laughs) podcasts we've ever done that one probably didn't have any redeeming qualities but i can again (laughs) when you when you stack a cast with this kind of talent yeah there's going to be some things to like about it even if there's really a lot of problems so let's start with best performance patrick when it comes to prometheus who is your best performance Damon, my best performance goes to Numi Rapace as Shaw, uh, our scientist, our lead scientist and our lead of the film. Uh, I thought she was a fantastic choice. I was actually very excited about her as a choice. She's in a lot of great stuff. I first saw her in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo um, way back in the day. Fantastic, you know, cool thriller that uh, Fincher eventually remade. Um, And the remake is good, by the way. I really like the remake. Yeah, I like the remake, too. Um, but yeah, Numi Rapace was just the right call. If they got anything perfect in this movie is that she was the lead, you know, like basically we need to put somebody in the Ripley, in the Ripley seat. We, we know that we know that's what the point of casting this character of Shaw is. is uh, how are we going to have another Ripley? Numi Rapace brings her own energy to it. Her own, I, I think she's got a lot of like, um, fantastic kind of emotional weight that she puts into the character and then when it's shit hits the fan and she needs to be a gut-wrenching scream queen she did it great she just did 
she 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 knew her assignment she came in she kind of reminds me of christian bale in that respect it's like it doesn't matter what the movie's like you know her performance is going to be good like she she will take over and do whatever she has to do to make her her portion of it good so she can walk away feeling good about what she did i think it's 100 percent the best thing about this movie is numi rupace's performance she does a really good job, and I watched an interview with her talking about this film, and she said when she got the role, she sat down with Ridley Scott, and he talked to her about Ripley. He talked to her about Sigourney's performance and how you know, she approached the role of Alien and how she approached that movie back in the day, and that was like her first major film role. And again, Numi Rapace at that point, I mean, she's done a ton of films since then, but she was more of a foreign actress kind of coming in and kind of making way in America at that point because uh, the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is a Swedish film, right? Am I getting that right? Yes. Um, so she came in and tackled it in a very unique way as like a, a reluctant heroine, I think is the way I would describe her. You know, she's totally. there trying to be a hero. She's trying to be a scientist and study, but she ends up having to be a bit of a heroine. And I think she does a great job. She is really one of the strongest points of this film, and I really, really enjoyed her performance, and I really liked it. Um, for me, as I said, I was super surprised that I didn't even remember Idris Elba was in this movie, but his performance isn't bad. I like Idris Elba. I think he's a great actor. Yeah. He should have been the new Bond. He's great. I like oh, him. Oh, I wish. God. Uh, but I actually ultimately gave my best performance to the real highlight, my favorite part of this entire movie, and the one part that I was like, you know what? getting more of this would have made the film better and getting more ties of this to alien would have been better, which is Michael Fassbender as David. He's so what I love about this, and this is, this is the, the we talked about pros and cons of this movie, kind of like what we liked, what we didn't like earlier. I wanted to save this conversation for now about what I loved most about this movie. Yeah. And I said this earlier, kind of joking, but I was serious too. The evolution of the android, the, the artificial person characters from Ash to Bishop, and now we're going back to David, because technically David would be an earlier version of the mm -hmm. artificial person going into Ash. Now, for one, I like that they didn't try to hide it like they did with Ash. That was a great twist in the original yeah. Alien, that it was actually a, an android, not a person. They didn't try to hide that. We knew that on minute one of this movie. But what I liked about this version was, as we've seen the evolution evolution coming into this movie they actually did it right with this one david is very much a robot driven by purpose his stated purpose is collect this data collect this information bring it back to us to help create more weapons whatever and then solve the answer which is what wayland wanted was how do i survive old age that's what he was there for he was trying to find a way to not die old man wanted to find a way to not die that's an age-old question i get it and that's what you know i have a feeling 20 years from now elon or 50 years from now elon musk is gonna have his head in a bottle trying to figure out how he can stay alive after <laughs> death that's just how rich fox work they don't ever want to give they don't ever want to go away so like how can i survive that i understand so david was like the ultimate villain and he was he, it was almost like a Patrick Bateman, like American Psycho detached performance. And it was perfect because as much as Ash showed like very little care and emotion, there were still some elements of like, there were hints that something was off with him, but not totally like full on you knew he was an android until he smacked him with the, the fire extinguisher and you realize that he's a something, you know, he's got the milk blood, whatever going on down there. And then when we get to Bishop, Again, what Bishop says in that movie is so true. He's like, with my new inhibitors, there's no way I could ever harm, harm or allow to harm a human being. David is probably the reason why that started. We're like, holy shit. Like, this guy's purpose was to collect data and bring it back to Wayland. So he just stuck to that fucking plan. Damn the scientists. Fuck everybody else. Collect the data and bring it back to create this ultimate weapon and to answer Wayland's immortal question about how I survived. He was great. He was the best part of the movie. He will, he's a very good part of the movie. hundred percent. He's right there with Numi Rupace amongst my favorite things in this movie. You're right. David, uh, the Android, which if, by the way, if, if no one has caught this, I'm sure most of our fans will know this, the, the, the naming convention for all the droids in the movies, in the alien movies are, a for Ash, B for Bishop, 
C for call in resurrection and D for David in Prometheus. So, so that means in Romulus, which is coming up, we'll, we're probably going to get a new Android. I'm just going to guess right now, Elijah. That's my guess. Cause we got to go to E. We know we're moving to E. I know Fetty Alvarez knows that. Anyway, I digress. David, our very first uh, artificial human that we've met from Wayland yutani is so robotic, is completely emotionally detached, does not give a shit, just marches and follows orders, and maybe even has a little bit of a sinister side to him because he has a bit of a, like, he doesn't like how Holloway treats him. Holloway's a fucking douchebag, by the way. Holloway is a scientist who clearly has ire for artificial humans. He doesn't like them. He treats them as subjugates like he's like he's like you're fucking you're just a robot get this thing for me get that for me he, te- he treats him with complete disrespect david has enough in his brain to go i don't like that and so he targets him he goes cool i know we're all put uh our, our perfect weapon it'll go in that douchebag he knows that much he's that intelligent but it is it's a weird haunting performance because you go okay well clearly when they finally got whatever pieces back from David or whatever information downloaded from the server, they went, Oh, we need to make some changes and make him more human. Well, the Ash version, we saw what happened when you made him more human. He was sexually frustrated. And so he decided to fucking try to kill people. They're like, okay, now how do we dial that back? And then they ended up with Bishop. So, and then they went to call bottom line is for this movie, it was cool to see this iteration of an artificial human. Because it is a very early version, it felt very robotic. The way he moves, the way he 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 physically changes his body. He got thinner on purpose for that role. He's like, I, I shouldn't have any mass on me. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. He got very lean for the role. Uh, took it very serious. And I'm actually excited to talk about the one thing I'm excited to talk about. In Covenant is the opening scene in Covenant. We will get to it where uh, Wayland and david have their first little talk as as he as he watches david sit and play a piano there's a fantastic little back and forth that goes on where waylon discovers oh shit this ai that i built is he might be a problem and yeah. we'll get to that later but it, it is down to fast bender's performance it's really good and I didn't pull it for audio, and I should have. I don't know why I didn't, because we didn't do best line for this episode, but I wanted to read a little bit of dialogue, which was by far my absolute favorite part of this movie. And again, when even when I was watching this, and like I was, this is already like halfway through the movie, and I'm like, fuck this movie. <laughs> even when this sequence came on, I was like, damn, that was really good. There's, a, there's an exchange between Holloway and David right before he poisons him with the alien liquid. And Holloway says to him, what we hoped to achieve was to meet our makers, to get answers, why they even made us in the first place. And David says, why do you think your people made me? And Holloway says, we made you because we could. And David's line is chilling and brilliant. He says, can you imagine how disappointing it would be for you to hear the same thing from your creator? The entire yeah. movie, we're told David doesn't feel emotion. And he doesn't. I mean, he's not, like, he's not an emotional being. He can't respond in that way. But the fact that he can recognize that, like how disappointing it would be just because you could, you did. That's his way of saying, fuck you. And I, I could wipe all of you out. And by the end, basically he does. Cause he, what he starts in that chain reaction with that, dropping that little bit of liquid into that drink he gives him sets everything off onto a horrific path after that. But that exchange, when he says, how disappointed would you be if that's what your creator said? And you know, what's crazy by the end, the, what we learned is the creators didn't want to create us. This just like they just it didn't happen, and they were coming back to fucking eradicate us. So they yeah, they were like, "That's either. a little accident we need to fix." Yeah, they're like, "Uh, yeah, we don't really need that shit staying on our heels, so we're gonna go ahead and wipe them off the face of the earth." <laughs> those so, humans yeah. are giving us ash vibe. I think we need to get rid of those those sexually frustrated fuckos over there on planet Earth. Yeah, so we're going to just get rid of them all together. So, yeah, that was just like, you know, it was just, again, it was, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a really, really strong uh, performance from from uh, from Michael Fass. I know I'm a big Michael Fassbender fan in general. I think he's great. I think he's a great actor. So oh, yeah. I like him. So now, Patrick, this movie, we are going to bring back an old classic. It's not a category that comes up every week. We don't get to use it every week. But only when it's necessitated. It's this particular award. One, 
Testicle! <laughs> Named after the great Nicolas Cage in the movie Prisoners of Ghostland, where he just gives it his best Nicolas Cage all to say one testicle. This is our one testicle award for overacting. <laughs> And Prometheus has a lot of it. When you put this category in there, Patrick, I was like, do I have to pick just one? <laughs> you uh, don't. But, Patrick, who gets your Nicolas Cage one testicle award for Prometheus? Damon, uh, my one testicle award goes to the very talented and the very incredible Charlize Theron, who plays Vickers, who basically is the Weyland yutani uh, you know, executive that goes along with them. Now, I actually, I remember at the time, like combing over as many interviews as I could, and I came across a lot of Charlize Theron talking about this movie and what she, the choices she made. I think I still find that stuff very fascinating, even if I don't like the choice. She wanted to be a little bit detached, a little bit robotic. She wanted people to guess that maybe she was a droid too. That was her plan. The plan went away, Damon, is what I'm saying. Is it, it just went the way it went. There's a couple of cool things that I do like about her. She, she goes, I like, I wanted to stay in like behind corners and I wanted to be revealed and I wanted it to seem like I was hovering. I kind of liked stuff like that. But the whole robotic thing, listen, organically speaking, Charlize Theron is one of the most impressive human beings you've ever seen. So to play robotic is to play completely against her strengths. And it just didn't quite, well, no, it did work, Damon. It was a robotic performance, maybe not in the way she intended. Um, and then there's always this factor, and I always say this, sometimes, often times, actually, I don't necessarily have a problem with the performance. I have a problem with the script and what the actor has to do based on the script. That line earlier, that you mentioned earlier, where she, she pauses to call Wayland father, just to make sure everybody knew she didn't write that line. I I'm assuming she didn't write that line. God awful line. <laughs> it just, I don't care how she acted that line. It wasn't going to work out. Uh, but yeah, that, that the choice of kind of trying to be the robotic person. And then by the way, by the way, at the end of the movie, she has to abandon that because she has to literally run flailing from a flaming ship and and die so you know she eventually abandons the roboticism but it was a strange choice Damon. yeah it was weird and also to mention this so a little bit of casting information on this one so when this movie was originally casting Charlize Theron Anne Hathaway Natalie Portman and Carrie Mulligan who are all incredible and I think all Oscar winning actresses if I'm not mistaken I think every one of them has won an Oscar they were all up for the role of Elizabeth Shaw and eventually went to Numi Rapace but they liked Charlize Theron so much that they offered her the role of Vickers. Now, in the original script, even Damon Lindelof's original script, Vickers was very much a very minor background character. Really didn't have any major plot in this movie. When they cast Charlize Theron, they're like, we got to give her more meat to chew on. We yeah. got to give her more on the... So they added scenes like the whole meet me in my place in 10 minutes, let's fuck Idris Elba. That's <laughs> thrown in there. So I like I get it because Charlize Theron is incredible. She's an incredible actor. I get it. I understand wanting to write for her and you get her. You want her to have more than like three kind of throwaway scenes. And I don't know that she would have done the movie for three little throwaway scenes. But when you start adding things to a movie just because you cast a certain actor, it's a problem. <laughs> it's it a problem. happens all the time happens it does. all the time and yes yeah. and to be clear yeah for anyone who doesn't know, that is hollywood it happens all the time i remember watching a podcast years ago there's and i actually really like this movie it's a, it's a fun dumb movie called the rundown with the rock mm -hmm. lane johnson where he goes to the amazon and to retrieve sean william sky he's trying to find stifler bring him back to the united states and they cast christopher walken in the movie as the bad guy as the villain and uh pete uh what's his name um oh god why am i forgetting his name he did friday night lights uh Oh, yeah, yeah, Peter Berg. Peter Berg, thank you, Peter Berg. He's yeah. the director. And 
the movie is what it is, but he said once they cast Christopher Walken, everybody wanted to write scenes for Christopher Walken, and so they kept writing and rewriting shit and throwing it at him like on the day of production, and Christopher Walken eventually snapped and p- got pissed off and erupted on everybody because he's like, he has a way of preparing for scenes, and like they just kept throwing new shit at him because everyone there was like, we got Chris Walken, we want to write for Chris Walken. And it eventually pissed off Chris Walken. He's like, this is not how I work. I like to have time with the material, prepare, know what I'm doing. But I get it. Like, I get it. You cast Charlize Theron. You want to give her more meat to chew on. But it almost felt like they gave her some rancid meat in this film because, boy, did it just not work. So I'm 100% on board with your, your, your pick here. And as I said, there could be multiple choices. But my choice for the one test score, which might be the absolute worst part of this movie. Now, again, to get a little background, there are many versions of the script out there. The John Spade script, which we've talked about, which I'm with you. I feel like I need to hunt this thing down and see what it actually said. In an earlier version of Damon Lindelof's script, they had a young, back, like an old background story with Wayland and David, which you talked about in Alien Covenant. There was a version of that in... Prometheus, where we saw a young Wayland and an early version of David in the original version of the script. And then, years later, we meet Wayland again on Prometheus. They eliminated the old part, or the, the younger part, and they kept the old part. But they cast Guy Pierce, who is a great actor. He's a good actor. I like Guy Pierce. But instead, they originally were going to cast Max von Sydow, the, the iconic Max von Sydow. Great call. <laughs> to play Wayland. But once they decided they needed a younger version of Wayland, they decided let's go ahead and let Guy Pierce play both versions. He'll play the young version and we'll put old makeup on him and let him play the new version as well, or the older version as well. Who boy, was that a choice? Because I understand in 2012, prosthetics, technology, practical effects. And by the way, they did try to use a lot of practical effects in this movie. They yeah, did. you could see it. That did not work. <laughs> he did not look old. He looked real bad, and his mannerisms were real bad. Like him hobbling around as an old man. I'm like, this is the like you. This is a hundred thirty million dollar production. You couldn't have spent a little bit more on the old man makeup you put on Guy Pierce. Or I, like, I I understand when you do a movie like The Irishman and you've got to take a, an eighty year old Robert De Niro and de age him down to look at least somewhat younger. I understand you can't. I understand why you do that because you got Robert De Niro and you got. I get it. I understand. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying you got to do it. No one would give a flying fuck if you played Guy Pierce as young Whalen and you had Max von Sydow as old Whalen. Who gives a fuck? No one would care. That's like 80 years difference. Like they're, you're not going to look the same. You're not. Like from 25 or 30 year old guy to who you are at 89, 90, or 100, however old he's supposed to be, you're not going to look the same. That makeup was the one testicle award. It looks so bad. Damn, I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, it is still, I think, the, of all the choices that are baffling, it's the top most baffling choice in the entirety of this movie. Why did they put him in an old man makeup? <laughs> Just cast an older actor. It's okay. We'll be fine. Like they don't, they never get this. I don't, it's got to be somebody. I don't know who it is. It's at the studio or whatever. And I understand Guy Pierce's position. He goes, I'm going to work with the great Ridley Scott. You fucking can't. I'm going to work alongside Charlize Theron and Idris Elba. This is great. Hell yeah, I'll do it. I understand why an actor does it. I don't understand why directors and studios do it. Cast an older actor to play an older character. Just do it. It never works. Now, there, there's an exception. I don't want to go on a long thing about it. The makeup in Maestro, uh, Bradley Cooper's most recent movie. I don't know if you saw that movie or not. I did. It was okay. Well, I didn't it, think it was great, but the makeup was great. The, uh, that opening scene with him as an older version of the character is, is the best old person makeup I've ever seen on an actor ever. So, you know, clearly we're, we're leveling up, but we weren't leveled up in 2012. Nine times out of 10, what you need to do if you don't got the makeup designer from Maestro is you just cast an older actor. It's still the craziest decision in this movie. It makes no sense. It sucks out loud. It's just like, why 
nothing nothing about this is selling nothing about this is selling why are we doing this the old man makeup do you remember the jackass skits where they had johnny knoxville yeah. old man makeup doing like routine oh yeah i guess that looked better than the wayland makeup in this movie yeah yes <laughs> yes it, you're not you're not wrong damon it's just, i was just like and that's that's the thing where ridley's supposed to come in there and go that looks like fucking shit get it out of here like and that's I what wonder, he's supposed to do and i don't I know wonder, why he didn't do that i wonder if to your point the speed of which ridley scott because when they started filming this they had the young version of wayland and then they did the old version i wonder if it's just because he works in such a rapid fire pace that he's like fuck it we already got it cast let's just move on like i wonder if that was i'm not i, I don't know that for a fact i, I couldn't he tell works you so fast i wonder if they're like okay we're cutting the young version we're gonna keep the old version but fuck it we're already here so let's just keep going i wonder if that was it because they he said there's proof out there they had they had cast max von Sydow, but when they decided to add in the young whale and they're like hold on we gotta have the same actor and so they cast guy pierce and then they cut out the other part and they let it just it bought like when he pops on in that hologram the first even in the movie theater in 2012 i was like what the fuck are we doing here what is this <laughs> i remember it back then we all just looked at each other like what the fuck? what the fuck and then my wife was watching uh, Prometheus with me a little bit. She was there in the theater with me back in 2012. But she's watching. She goes, why the fuck did they do that? It's still a problem, guys. Yeah. Like, just, just, ca there are plenty of older actors that are incredibly talented. Just bring them in to play 80, 90, 100-year-old version of a character. Just do it. We're not, we're going to be fine if they are not a, the exact version of the actor that's the young version. We'll be fine. Yeah, I just that was that was one testicle all over the place on that one. Uh, let's move on to our next category. We're going to go from a very low low to a very high high, and that is our next category: the great Ken Frey Banana Hammock MVP Award, named after great character actor Ken Frey in the movie From Beyond when he jumped down a flight of stairs and into a basement with a butcher knife to stop a creature wearing nothing more than a thong bikini. That is an MVP performance if I've ever heard of one. So we named the award after the man. This is our Ken a Banana Hammock MVP award. And Patrick, for Prometheus, who gets your MVP award? Uh, I, I almost want to change my answer to John Spates. I'm sure his script was better. I'm just That's sure of it. I'll, just, I'll spoil it right now. That's my answer, John Spates. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get more into that in a little bit. So I'm glad you mentioned that because that literally is my answer. <laughs> but, but there is another thing about this movie that I actually really appreciate that is very much part of the choices that they made and that was the creature design and i didn't pull up the name because very often sometimes people get left out of it so i just left it away but the creature design in this movie is very impressive i like how the engineers look i they th i think they look pretty great actually uh, and i believe the main engineer that we deal with most i believe it's one one from game of thrones i believe yeah. that's the actor who played one one is, is is in the suit the suit looks great the uh, the design of the suit looks great um i like their musculature it almost like like looked like just next level up human musculature i like as for stupid as the scene is i like this the space cobra it looks good i like the giant face hugger it looks good i'd like the little c-section baby alien squid thing it looked good i even like the proto xenomorph i was like cool it doesn't quite look like the xenomorph that we know yet because it shouldn't be there yet it's evolving to that so the first version of it looked really good. They used a lot of practical effects and it showed and it and it still held up. I mean, just watching it now, just a day or two before this podcast, I was like, that shit still looks good. So props to the creature designers. I think that's what drove me nuts about the old man makeup is because all the creature design was great. Like, how do you get this so right and then get that so wrong? Uh, yeah, no, you're right. It was. It, it is. It, it, again, like I said, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to repeat what I said, but if this had just been a standalone origin of species movie, I I'm not saying I would have loved it. I was still had a huge amount of issues with it, but at least what the choices they made would have made more sense. Not trying to connect it back to alien. Cause just the squid creature, the, the octopi creature and the, the, the uh, engineers all look great. Like I said, you're right. The design is all fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so yeah, my MVP, I gave to John Spates. I didn't get a chance to read the original script, but I read that interview with Damon Lindelof and that quote I read earlier where he said, when I read his script, it's just like, it was called Alien Zero was the name of the script. 
and it had face huggers and xenomorphs and eggs and all that stuff. And I'm like, I don't know what else was in that movie. I have no idea. But it sure as shit sounds like an alien movie to me, whereas this one doesn't. So while I have no idea what was in John Spate's script, knowing John Spate's filmography, you know, going through his entire filmography. And again, I know I mentioned a couple. But let me just mention a couple. Let me just mention this. It's not, he doesn't have a huge list, by the way. He did The Darkest Hour, which is a movie I've seen. Uh, back in the day, that was a 2011 film. Yeah, it's pretty uh, good, actually. Yeah, yeah, Emil Hirsch. And yeah, it's not, not bad. Uh, Prometheus, Doctor Strange, Passengers. Now, he did the sto- the original story for the Mummy remake with Tom Cruise, but he didn't write the script. They rewrote it, and so he gets a credit for it, but he doesn't actually write on it. And then he did Dune and Dune Part 2. Pretty good. Now, Passengers yeah. isn't a great movie. I've seen it. It's not particularly great, but it's all right. But he has, he seems to have a flair for sci-fi. Based on that alone, I'm like, I can't imagine it wouldn't have been. And, and as you said, it sounded like a minimalist alien story, which is what Alien was. And it worked well. So, again, I have no idea exactly what he was writing, but I'm giving him my MVP award because it sounds like he made the movie you and I wanted versus <laughs> what we got with Prometheus. Yeah, very likely. I very much like those Dune movies. And so I'm like, man, if the guy who wrote those movies had an idea for an alien movie, sign me the fuck up. So I'm very here. I'm going to have to hunt that script down. If you find it, send it to me because I'm going to look for it as well because I want to know what it looks like. Because when I read Damon Lindelof's, when I read Damon Lindelof's quotes, I was like, damn, that sounds like a good movie. What the fuck did you do? <laughs> That goes right up there with Joss Whedon going, it's not that they changed my script because they didn't. It's just that I would have done it differently. It's like, shut the fuck up. You just did it wrong, fucker. Stop talking. Just stop talking. (laughs) Just stop talking, dude. Stop talking. And again, I say this lovingly because I do. I like the Damon Lindelof. Yeah. yeah, Who is, you know, Joss Whedon seems like a piece of trash, but I will say he wrote a lot of stuff I did like, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Damon Lindelof, by and large, writes nothing but stuff I enjoy. This just isn't a good example of, you know. What are you going to do? Can't win them all? They can't can't all be hits. They can't all be hits. (laughs) Uh, Let's move on to Best Kill, because this is ultimately, yes, they do turn this into a sci-fi horror film. So, Patrick, what was your best kill in Prometheus? I keep wanting to call Alien Zero now. Prometheus. (laughs) My favorite kill I called uh, Holloway Gets Roasted. Now, Holloway was the other scientist and the love interest to Shaw. And, Damon, he was a douchebag. He was a douchebag even when they were just talking about the mission. You could just tell he was one of the, like his character. And this is actually credit to the to the actor, which I should I should probably actually give you his name. Um, oh God, where the fuck is it? Okay, anyway, he was a character. The the way he infused the character with that douchiness, it shows that like all he gave a shit about. It's Logan Marshall Green, by the way, who was the star of um, Upgrade, which is actually a really cool uh, movie by Lee Wanell. Um, Holloway was very much like focused on his vision and what he wanted and what he what he wanted to achieve and he really didn't care who he stepped on in the process and he came across like a totally like self-righteous douche and and especially the way he poked at David even though we knew David was up to no good we were still just like you know what like it's shitty that you're treating somebody like that and so you never felt bad for him. And when he got roasted, right, because he he's infected with this fucking alien shit and he knows better. He's like, yeah, I'm I'm infected. You need to kill me. And they roast him right in front of Shaw <laughs> to her horror. But I was like, yeah, good fucking douchebag. <laughs> like like that's classic horror. Like sometimes you, the douchebag needs to get it. And he got it in this movie. That was the one good decision he made was just like, yeah, you need to kill me because Charlie Theron didn't want to let him back on the ship. And he's just like, yeah, roast me. You need to kill me. And she's like, I yeah. sure shit will. So yeah. yeah. You're like, all right, good job. Yeah, no, that was good. That was good. So weirdly for all the other weird deaths on this movie and, you know, even the space Cobra popping through a suit and all the other weird shit that happened. My favorite kill, honestly, just the one that was just like great moment in the movie, which again, for a lot of movie that I didn't like, there were a couple good moments is after they resurrect the um, the engineer and David, who has studied the language, and Waylon's right there, and he's like, I need answers, I need answers, and, and he talks to him in that weird language, 
And the engineer understands what he's saying. He looks right at him. He's like, oh, shit, I get what you're saying. And he's just like, fuck you, and rips his head off <laughs> and just chucks him on the ground. Now, again, I know it's an android, not a human, so it would have been a lot more gory, you know, a lot gorier had it been a human. But when he just looks at David like, yeah, I don't give a fuck, and just rips his head off and chucks it on the ground, I was like, damn, that was cool. Like, that was one of the coolest moments of the movie where, like, all this leads to this moment. Waylon, this rich asshole, is, like, desperate to find answers. David is his emissary, and the engineer's just like, the fuck are you doing? Like, huh? Rip your head off and talk, you know, shit you on the, shit you on the side of the boat. So, yeah, I just, I like that didn't, part. Didn't the engineer, did the engineer smack Wayland with with david's head or was it just his hand i can't remember i think i think he i think he chucked the thing down and swatted him but i can't remember yeah, like swatted him, him or something yeah. he, he like he like kills wayland in the process yeah like but he twit like, he just grabs him by the head lifts him up and just like twists he's like him. let me just pop this thing off you little fucker you don't get to speak my language <laughs> yeah it's just like yeah he just looks at him like what the he's like the fuck are you doing you know, like, <laughs> that was his reaction i just love that kill because it was just like damn because david was such a huge part of the movie and then he's just like yeah we're just gonna get rid of you real quick here so i just you know and to their credit actually the alien the uh, android kills in all the all the major alien films are actually pretty cool from alien with ash and yeah. Bishop when he gets ripped apart by the queen aliens pretty cool too so yeah all about the milk blood folks all about the milk blood on this show uh let's talk about best gore and again spoiler just to give it the answer your answer is my answer i'm going to go a little further than your answer so oh, great. let's talk about best gore in this movie uh damon this is a a fantastic moment in the movie i loved it then and i still loved it now and i call it the c-section from hell so very rapidly after um shaw is impregnated by holloway um, she starts to feel the signs of being pregnant and sure enough she is so she knows very well because she's not supposed to be pregnant at all because she can't she explains she can't have kids she goes to the med pod and is like hey get this thing out of me right away and in a very tense scene the machine uh proceeds to slice her open and pluck this alien out of her and she just lets out these blood curdling screams it's just a great performance piece for her this moment incredibly harrowing and it's and you know like she's just barely getting enough uh, uh anesthetic to sort of not pass out and completely collapse that's about it otherwise she's screaming bloody murder to the point where my nine-year-old son today said what were you watching last night there was some woman like screaming and i go yeah that, that was probably the best scene in that whole movie um but i really loved it because it was just it's one of those scenes where the the shit that's going on is super intense and again what this movie does really well is the effects. It looks like her stomach is being lasered open. It looks like gore is being plucked from her belly. It's like the staples going on like onto her skin. It all looks great. The fucking embryo splashing onto her with all that fucking embryonic fluid and shit. It's fucking nasty. It's fucking hardcore. It is. That is the best gore in this movie. And it is, I, I, I thought it was like, it was a good twist in the plot, but also kind of weird where the medical bay is like, this thing's only outfitted for men. Now, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe there was a different part of the ship where there was a different medical bay for women. She just, because again, at that moment, she's like running for her life and they're like, you can't do this. And she's like, I'm getting this thing out of me. And so yeah. she shuts herself off and closes off the medical bay. And the medical bay says, this thing's only set up for males. And so she has to program it to pull this thing out or create a c-section i thought that was a kind of an interesting twist because it's not like it's almost like haphazardly cutting this thing out of her which made it that much gnarlier um but yeah you mentioned it there the the, the gore that i went one step for is when she literally staples her fucking stomach back closed it's so gross and intense and you're just like oh my god like she's literally just stapling across her stomach and it's just so gross and and just like i can't even imagine like i've had stitches and i've had staples and under even anesthesia like it fucking hurts mm -hmm. and i can't even imagine that that what that would feel like so yeah that yeah, was super yeah. anytime like gore's always fun which have a great gore in this film but my favorite gore of any horror film is when i can feel what they're feeling when i'm like mm, when you kind of like get that you know it's like the nails on the chalkboard thing like that's yeah. that's the best gore that's like watching martyrs and i'm just like fuck this movie it's just <laughs> Uh, it's great, by the way. Martyrs is a fantastic movie. It's just really hardcore. That's kind of how I felt about about Prometheus with that scene. I was like, mm, no, no, I can, I can do this. I know what this feels like. This sucks. This is not good. So yeah, that was definitely best score. Um, 
Let's talk about best alien life form. And you already know the answer I'm going with here, Patrick, just because I'm like, you know what? Fuck this movie. Best <laughs> alien life form. It is the space cobra. <laughs> Give me that. The space cobra has to be the weirdest, dumbest thing in this movie, and especially the choice that the biologist makes to just cuddle up to it. Be like, hey, little thing, what are you up to? You're a good little guy. You deserve to die, for one, but dumbest choice ever made. But the space cobra it was got, got to be one of the weirdest, like... How can we create a, something from Star Wars, like that eyeball thing in the trash compactor in the original Star yeah. Wars? How can we create our version of that? We're going to create a Space Cobra and one of the dumbest scenes ever. But the Space Cobra gets my award for Best Alien Life Form, because why the fuck not? Yeah, why the fuck not? Now, it was Best Alien Life Form, not dumbest, <laughs> just for clarification. But, uh, you know, your choice is your choice. Um, I, like, parts of that scene went really well for me. Like, when it wraps around his arm and starts to break it, I was like, oh, I like that. I just don't like how they got there. You know, that, that, again, we don't want to we, we don't want to rehash what happened. But indeed, like the design of it, again, at, even watching it now, because I assume that it was mainly CG, especially when it's crawling up his arm and all that stuff, you can kind of tell. But those practical moments when you're seeing it and, and it kind of opens its hood up and all that stuff and all those little details, I'm like, it's a very minimalist creature, but damn, it's well made. Like, I don't see the seams. It doesn't look like a fucking puppet. Like, uh, yeah, stupid scene, but a well made creature. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Like, I just, it's such a dumb scene because of how it played out, but you know, it looked good. So, yeah, I, I get just again, it's just choices, just choices. <laughs> Oh, there were choices. <laughs> my uh, my best alien life form did go to the biggest face hugger. Yes, Damon, uh, you you will likely never see a face hugger this large ever again. For some reason, once Shaw plucks it, the little squid out of her stomach and just leaves it off to the side there somewhere in the med bay, and she runs off and a, a bunch of shit happens. Um, it decides to grow incredibly rapidly grow humongous it turns into a i don't know it's like the size of like my office it becomes a gigantic face hugger and it does have this weird showdown with the engineer and eventually it attaches itself to the engineer but there's a couple of great shots one of them is is from the pov the engineer looking right down the face of it and it's got all these little mouths with all these little sharp little teeth in it and i remember then and i even now I was like, this shit looks fucking cool. This is a cool design. Whatever this is, it didn't have the Giger sexuality to it. That's what was missing from this. It was a completely different design. The creature designers wanted to go in their own route, and it makes sense because we're not at the Geiger stuff yet in the story. So they made something that looked completely different, but what they did make was pretty impressive. And I ultimately did like the idea of this face hugger that's so big, it literally just lays over the top of you and there's nothing you can do to get away from it. So I agree, it did look good. Uh, and I think the squid kind of grew, to, like it was growing to the size of the one that Adrian Veidt, Ozymandias dropped on the world in Watchmen apparently. <laughs> it just kept growing bigger and bigger. And the reason I have a problem with it, the, the design, you're right, the design is cool, and I actually really did like the 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 when the close up of like the teeth and everything that was really cool. And I don't mean to like sit here and just criticize everything about this film, but it's they created a solution to the problem, which is the the engineer is giant, so we have to create a giant face hugger, and that's just like another problem with this movie. Like, I understand the regular little face hugger wouldn't fit right on the fucking. Yeah, or he'd be strong enough to just rip it off. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like they have to create, yeah. have to create a solution to a problem they create, and it's just that bugs me because like, oh, we have to create a giant face hugger to fit on the giant engineer. But the look of it, you're right, it was cool. So again, I'm not trying to just continue, yeah. just continue to shit on everything, but we have to admit that's why it was a giant face hugger because they made a giant engineer, so it had to be giant. Yeah, they had to make something that even the engineer couldn't overpower. That was the big thing. You know, the engineer's clearly about, you know, eight to 10 feet tall and just solid muscle. Like he could do whatever he wanted with a little face or he could just crush it in his hand. So they were like, well, how do we change that? And that they changed it by making it so big he can't overpower it. Which, by the way, another, we're talking about the problems of evolution in this movie, which I could go on for hours upon hours. At what point did they develop acid for blood? When the fuck does that happen? That might be in Covenant. I, I, I'm actually very now very curious to comb over Covenant for this podcast I, I, to get some right. of those answers because he's going to design the Xenomorph. 
you're right i know i'm just saying yeah. like it's just it's mine it just it just bothers me to no end like come on stop trying to overcomplicate shit this is supposed to be 30 years <laughs> earlier they'd have acid for fucking blood already would they i don't know i don't know yeah, david yeah. saw something there uh, just uh, don't even Anyways, uh, <laughs> next category, Patrick, before my head pops off my shoulder. Uh, can we survive this horror film? We already know the answer to this question, and we've had the same answer for every Alien film, which I'll let you explain because you're absolutely correct. This is the category where you and I inject ourselves into whatever horror film we're reviewing, and we just ask the simple question, could we survive this horror film with our smarts, with our horror knowledge? Could we survive this horror film? But like all Alien films, the answer is the same. Please explain. Like all alien films, the answer is you absolutely cannot survive in the alien universe. When you come in contact, in this case, you're coming in contact with the original, whatever it is, primordial goo that is some sort of, you know, uh, biological weapon. Oh, it's going to fuck you up. And the minute it touches anybody in this movie, they are fucked. They genuinely are. And Shaw and Vickers make it to the end by chance, and then Shaw just get smashed by a spaceship that's that's how she dies but but uh or, sorry a vickers gets smashed by a spaceship that's how she dies shaw thinks she's getting out but as we know damon and we will learn in alien covenant you cannot escape once you once you have crossed paths with this it is deadly the only way out damon is to have the movie alien resurrection where at the end they go we did it we saved the earth <laughs> So some of the best writing I've ever heard, yeah. <laughs> but you can't, you, you just can't, you cannot, once you cross paths with a xenomorph, you cannot survive it. It is impossible. The great Ripley could not do it. What makes you think this band of dimwits was ever going to be able to do it? Yeah. We're not making it out of this movie, but I did find, and again, I hadn't seen this movie in over a decade. I completely forgot at the end of the movie that Numi Rapace's character gets on a ship and she's like i'm gonna go find the engineer's home world and ask them why they did this because it worked out so well for david asking them for fucking advice. right uh, yeah that went well for uh for an android it went really well and so. i know i know they change it in alien cover i i loosely remember that movie a little bit more but yeah i know they 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 give you an answer to that but at the end of the movie i was like why do I not remember her escaping on a different ship? I was like, when the fuck? I don't really remember that from like my first viewing of this movie. I just shut it out, I guess. But I was like, really? That's how we're going to end this? She gets away? Like, oh, God. Oh, choices. <laughs> uh, last category, Patrick. Let's just get into it. Is it scary? Uh, at the end of the day, Prometheus. Is it scary? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's I, it, what, what I learned on this last viewing is it's more, it's more sci-fi than I remember. Like, you know, we, we've talked about how flexible the Alien series is in terms of its horror, but also it can be an action movie. In the case of Resurrection, it could be a comedy. In the, in the case of uh, uh, an accidental a, comedy, <laughs> an accidental absolute joke. Uh, in, in the case of Alien 3, kind of a, a prison thriller. Like, but but there's always there is always a through line of horror. The horror the through horror through line is here. It takes a little longer to get to because there's this kind of discovery element in the beginning. There's some baffling choices that pull you right out of the horror. Um, but it's trying to scare you. It just doesn't do a very good job of it. Yeah, uh, it's. I'll say this. This is one of my slightly backhanded compliments. It is horrific. I mean, it is that. Like, what happens to them is horrific. The problem yeah. is, yeah. as we've said dozens of times, is that all the horror is self chosen and self inflicted because they make the stupid ass decisions that lead to the horror. So you're right. This is an 80s slasher dressed up as an alien movie. And yeah, you deserve to die because you all died, made the dumbest decisions possible. So I'm not going to feel bad that Jason cut your head off with a machete or in this case, a giant octopi <laughs> attacks or whatever the fuck they do in this movie. So yeah, it, it's, <laughs> but it is, it is horrific. I was thinking about, you mentioned about the alien goo. I was like, would this movie have been met better if it was titled Alien Prometheus colon the secret of the ooze like turn into girls like would that have been a better title for this movie Prometheus the secret of the ooze <laughs> go David go David go no, go David go David go David go 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 <laughs> hold on Zeno Zeno rap Zeno 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 rap, rap. Zeno, 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 rap. rap. <laughs> 
I'm so glad you got that joke, the vanilla ice reference. Thank you for that. <laughs> Come on. Proves, proves, proves why not only we do this podcast, why we are such close friends, because you got that reference. So thank you. Fucking for- A, we got. Fucking A, I got that right. <laughs> Now I'm gonna have to go listen to Vanilla Ice song after we're. I'm not even kidding. When I'm done with this podcast. I'm listening to, I'm listening to Ninja Rap when this podcast is wrapped. Uh, all right, that's our episode of Prometheus. Anytime we do a really bad movie, it's like we sell at the end of it. Like, oh god damn. Uh, we have to take a deep breath. It's exhausting to do these ones. Here's, you know, it's funny, and I will say this because. When we started talking about doing the Alien franchise, we knew there was going to come a point where we got to Alien Resurrection. And even at that point, I was already saying, like, I did not like Prometheus. But at that point, you hadn't rewatched it. You said, I actually like Prometheus. Now, I know your opinion has changed. We knew that coming in, that we were going to get to the end of this road where, it unfortunately, it's almost like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where it starts really strong, and boy, does it careen off a fucking ledge. (laughs) Uh, That's where we're at in this this franchise. And I'm saying this as as a precursor. To my deepest hopes, thoughts, and I'll even say the word prayer, even though I don't pray. Fetty Alvarez, your only hope. Save oh, us. please, Betty. Please save us from the, the Texas Chainsaw curse. <laughs> please, please. The trailer for Alien Romulus fucking rocks. Looks Love great. It. Please, dear God. That's all I'm asking. Like, let that movie be redeemable because we do not close i have i've only seen alien covenant one time saw it in the theater have not seen it besides yeah. that this will be my first time since then didn't think of it much didn't think much of it back then don't know mm-hmm. that my opinion is really going to change now so uh yeah i have a feeling the next one in this franchise is probably not going to be a, a fun go either but you never know Maybe <laughs> change. I don't you know. never I know, know. My, I know my opinion of prometheus only strengthened upon the rewatch and you actually came around <laughs> to my way of thinking so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't absolutely hate this movie, but I, I see its weaknesses very clearly now. Yeah, much different than you did in 2012. So. Oh yeah. Oh, this is a stark difference from 2012. <laughs> you went the opposite way of me. You're like, you're like, I used to think I liked this movie. Now I rewatch it. I really don't like this movie. Yeah, this is not my favorite in the franchise. I don't know how high it's going to rank. Yeah, yeah, we gotta do our franchise ranking at the end. It's gonna be a rough go after we rank one and two. I know. I, you know what? Spoiler alert aliens alien for me alien aliens for you after that it's a crap already <laughs> yeah we already know what our ones and twos are respectively but now it's a matter of finding out what goes below it so come yeah. on fetty can you can you can you come in at number three that's gonna be a that's gonna be a tall ask dude if come in at number four i'll be happy i just you know alien <laughs> three had problems but i still ultimately like that movie get get in that realm get in that realm where i could be like i know david fincher hates it but i still like alien 3 yeah i still like alien give 3. me that give me an equal to that and i'll be the happiest guy in the world just please for the love of god do not go down the joss whedon alien resurrection road. Please, <laughs> he's like he's like it's all based off a of resurrection basically we're just using that as the template we're like we're fucked <laughs> yeah, just, that, you'll just you'll just see me just fall face first onto the fucking desk <laughs> at the beginning of the podcast. So, uh, all right, folks, that is our show. We'll be back next week with another edition of the show. Obviously, thank you to everyone that tunes in each and every week. Make sure you check us out on all your favorite podcast platforms: Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, please subscribe over to our YouTube channel if you really want to see our extended reactions to some of these moments. You can definitely see it in our faces when we love or hate a movie. So uh, go over there subscribe it really does help us out uh we all know it's all based on algorithms and subscriptions definitely help us so please go over and subscribe just search rewind of the living dead if you got questions comments movies you'd like us to review hit us up on email anytime rot living dead at gmail.com that's rot living dead at gmail.com you can also find us on social media just search rewind of the living dead we are on twitter slash x we are on facebook and we are also on instagram we post clips from the show over there uh, and you can also follow us on our own personal TikTok channels for as long as we have TikTok left in this country. Uh, I am at Damon of the Dead, and you are over there at Patrick of the Living Dead. And then you can also find us on our own personal social media channels on Twitter and Instagram. For me, is at Damon Martin, and you are at Director Patrick. And a big thank you, as always, for everyone that tunes in to each and every episode of. 
Rewind of the Living Dead, we appreciate you. Sometimes these episodes are tough, but they are a lot of fun. So even when we don't like them, I mean, these are actually some of our fun, most fun episodes. So thank you so much for tuning in. As always, we'll be back next week with another edition of Rewind of the Living Dead. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you then. Peace, Father.